Hello again everyone. This is a continuation of the previous video on characteristic roots where we discussed the theory for finding the solutions to second order differential equations. These are linear differential equations of second order with constant coefficients and they're also homogeneous which means the right hand side is zero. And as you may recall when we discussed the theory for this in the previous video, if you haven't seen part one Make sure that you watch that first. These are the three cases you run into, right? So you've got the, based on the characteristic equation, which is this, these are the three different types of ways you're going to write the final solution or the general solution. And that all depends on how many, uh, how many roots you've got and what kind of roots they are. So, so we did some examples. What we will do in this video is essentially do a few more examples and then bring it back to the uh, special application which is the spring mass system and also show you v some visuals of what the solutions look like which is a very key qualitative analysis part of understanding the solutions all right so let's do a few more examples and again i always recommend that you try these problems before you watch me do them so i'm going to write down the problem I always recommend that you pause the video, try the problem, and then resume the video and see if you got the same thing. So here is another equation. y double prime plus 2y prime plus 8y equals to 0. So the question is solve this differential equation. So we start out the same way we did in the previous problems that we've seen in the previous video. First, you generate the characteristic equation, which corresponds to this differential equation, which will be simply r squared plus 2r plus 8 equals 0. Then you have, you have to solve it, so if it factors, factor it. If it doesn't factor, use quadratic formula. So a is 1, b is 2, c is 8. So the quadratic formula, let's find the delta first, which is b squared minus 4ac. So that's going to be 4 minus... 4 times 1 times 8, so that's 4 minus 4 times 8, which is 32, so that's negative 28. So immediately, I know exactly what I'm dealing with here. Because the delta is negative, I know I'm going to get imaginary answers for r, which means I'm dealing with the uh, two-conjugate imaginary case. So r is equal to negative b plus or minus square root of delta over 2a. So that's going to be negative 2 plus or minus square root of negative 28 over 2 times a, which happens to be 2. Now, just on the side here, square root of negative 28, what can we do with that? Well, we can break that up into square root of negative 1 times square root of 4 times square root of 7. So this becomes 2 square root of 7 i. Be careful, the i is not under the square root. Right? So we can write this as negative 2 plus or minus 2 square root of 7 i, everything over 2. Again, we're not done simplifying in these scenarios unless there's nothing in common between the numbers that show up here, which in this case is not true. Here we have 2. 2 is a common factor. So we can factor out the 2 from the top which makes it negative 1 plus or minus square root of 7 i over 2. And now I can cross out the 2's because you can think of this as multiplication by 1 there. So I'm times in by 2 top and bottom. Cancellation rule from algebra tells me I can cross out that 2. So r is equal to negative 1 plus or minus square root of 7 i. So that's the key there. Well, if I look at this, See if I can get this to stop flickering there. So if I look at this and I compare it and reconcile it with this case when we looked at the nodes from the previous video, we can see that we are in this third case where r is equal to alpha plus or minus i beta or beta times i. And we said in this scenario, this is the formula you want to use. This is the blueprint on how you write the actual uh, general solution. So we're just going to follow that. 
right? And we just, all we need to know is what's my alpha, what's my beta, and plug the alpha here and plug the beta here and just use this pattern. That's all we do, just follow this blueprint, right? So let's actually write the blueprint first. So the blueprint is y equals e to the alpha t, c1, don't forget the c1, cosine beta t plus c2 sine beta t. So in my case, what's the alpha? Well, this is the alpha. What's the beta? Be careful, the beta is only the number in front of the i, don't include the i in it. Okay, so beta is the square root of seven. So my general solution for this problem is y equals e to the negative t times c1 cosine square root of 7 times t plus c2 sine square root of 7 times t. So this is the actual solution and that's for c1 and c2 arbitrary real constants. So those are called arbitrary parameters. That's it. That's the solution. So now you've seen it all. Now you've seen the three cases. Between last video and this video, you basically have seen all three formulas, like for the three different scenarios. Let's try another one. How about this example? 3y double prime plus 4y prime plus 9y equals to 0. So, again, pause the video, try it, and then resume and see, and, and you can compare notes with my work. So the characteristic equation is 3r squared plus 4r plus 9 equals to 0. Now what I'm going to do here is try to solve this. If I can see that I can factor it, then go for it. If you can't, go with the quadratic uh, quadratic formula anyway. So I'm going to actually do the quadratic, because even if it factors, quadratic formula will tell you. will get you the right answers. So I always recommend doing the delta first, because that kind of, that's half the battle, because it can tell you, it gives you a preview of things to come. It can tell you where you're heading, and also, when you go to write the quadratic formula, you already have half of it done. You have the part under the square root already computed. So b squared minus 4ac will be 16 minus 4 times 3 times 9. I can already see this is going to be the imaginary case again. So this is going to be, I have to actually take 16 and I'm going to multiply, so I'm going to take 16 minus 108. So this gives me 92, negative 92. Good, so it's negative, of course, means I'm gonna have imaginary. So the R is gonna be negative B, plus or minus square root of delta, everything over 2A. This is gonna be negative four, plus or minus square root of 92. Everything over 2A, be careful, 2A here is not just two, it's gonna be six because a is 3. So I'm not done until I simplify this. This is actually negative 92. can forget my negative. So what's, what can we do with 92? 92 is divisible by 4. So square root of, on the side here, square root of negative 92 can be broken up. Fix this here. So square root of negative 92 can be written as square root of negative 1, square root of 4, and square root of 23. So we can write it as 2 radical 23i. So this is going to be negative 4 plus or minus 2 radical 23. Extend my symbol for the square root to cover the 23, but it shouldn't cover the i. Everything over the 6. And now here we are again, use that trick I showed you earlier. To reduce this, you ask the question, what do these three numbers have in common? The biggest number that divides into all three of those is the number two, so we factor out the two. So this becomes two times 
negative 2 plus or minus square root of 23i, everything over 6. Now, the 6 can be reduced with the 2, so that's going to make it a 3. So what we've got so far is negative 2 plus or minus square root of 23i, everything over 3. But again, with imaginaries, it's important that you split it into something plus something times i. So we don't want to leave it like this. In fact, we're going to split it as negative 2 thirds plus or minus radical 23 thirds i. That makes it also easier for us to immediately recognize that the alpha is negative 2 thirds and the beta is radical 23 thirds. And those are what goes into my blueprint here. Okay, so I'll write that on the next page here. So my solution is going to be y equals e, no, okay, negative 2 thirds, e to the negative 2 thirds t, don't forget that part, c1 cosine the beta, which is square root of 23 thirds t, plus c2 sine square root of 23 thirds t. And again, this is for any c1 and c2. So that's my general solution for this scenario. All right, one more, just to make sure you got this. And also for variety, we're going to do an IVP now. So y double prime minus 4y prime plus 7y equals 0. But they're giving us some initial conditions. So y of 0 is 0, and y prime of 0 is negative 1. So the initial part is going to be very similar. The only new part now that's going to challenge you a little bit more, because the formula is a little bit harder here, is how do you utilize the initial conditions to find the c1 and the c2 and then plug them back in. All right, so again, pause the video, give it a shot, and then come back and see what, how it compares to my work. All right, welcome back, everybody. Let's see. So first thing I'm going to do here is write my characteristic equation. R squared minus 4R plus 7 equals to 0. Okay. So A is 1, B is negative 4, C is 7. Delta will be 16 minus 4 times 1 times 7. So that's 16 minus 28. So that's negative 12. Negative means imaginary. So the R is going to be 4 plus or minus square root of negative 12 over 2. Again, I'm going a little bit faster here, but hopefully you've got these already, these steps down by now. So this is going to be 4 plus or minus 2 radical 3i over 2. You can factor out the 2, and that leaves you with 2 times 2 plus or minus radical 3i over 2. These cancel, so your r is going to be 2 plus or minus radical 3i. So this is your beta, this is your alpha. So your y is equal to e to the alpha t times c1 cosine radical 3t plus c2 sine radical 3t. That's the general solution. Okay, I hope everybody is okay up to this point and is following along nicely. Now, to use the initial conditions, remember that you you need the y and you need the y prime. So let's immediately go ahead and take the derivative so we have access to the y prime. So y prime is going to be a little bit annoying because we have to use a product rule from calculus. All right, because we got a product there. So if you use the product rule, this becomes 2e to the 2t, and you keep everything the same inside the parentheses, plus keep the e to the 2t, and now differentiate what is inside the parentheses. 
Okay, let's see, I might be able to fit that in. Let me see, I might have to squeeze this in there. So plus, so let me kind of compress space here. So this is C2 sine square root of 3t plus e to the 2t times if you take the derivative of this square root of 3 will come out and the cosine becomes negative sine so you get negative square root of 3 c1 sine square root of 3 t oops i think i'm going to fail in my attempt of trying to squeeze all this in small space and make it legible okay then take the derivative of this part well sine turns into a cosine and again radical 3 comes out so this is plus radical 3 c2 cosine radical 3 t okay i hope that's clear okay here's the good news when I actually use the initial condition, I'm going to plug in 0 for t. So as ugly and horrible as these two formulas look, especially the second one, I'm not worried about that. When I go to actually plug in the initial conditions, a lot of this stuff is going to simplify nicely. So that's the good news. So I don't have, and please don't try to do this because you're wasting your time, I don't have to actually try to collect like terms or do anything with this yet. Because I know when I plug in the numbers, it's going to make it so much easier to work with anyways. So plug the numbers in first, and then see how you can make sense out of it. All right, let's start with y of 0. What's y of 0? If you put 0 in there, and put 0 in there, and put 0 in there for t, this becomes c1 cosine of 0 plus c2 sine of 0 all of this times 1 essentially so what does that mean well this is going to go away that's just 0 and this is 1 so you just get c1 so that that wasn't bad at all look all of that reduced to just c1 so what is that supposed to equal according to the initial condition they said set that equal to 0 so that immediately gives me one of the two um, parameters I'm looking for so I already know c1 is 0 good Let's plug in 0 in y prime. So be careful again, don't miss out on any t. Anywhere you see t, plug in a 0. And again, you see why I said earlier this is going to get easier once you plug the numbers in? Because anytime you have a 0 inside the sign, it disappears. And anytime you have a 0 in an exponential, it's going to make the exponential into a 1. So this part here is just going to become 2. This part here becomes C1 plus 0. Then 1 times negative, this will disappear and you'll get square root, you get 0 plus square root of 3 C2. So all that ugly stuff actually cleaned up really nicely and it reduces to 2 C1 plus radical 3 C2. And they want that to match up with negative 1. Okay, here's the good news. I already know C1 is 0, substitute it in here. So that tells me radical 3 C2 must equal to negative 1, which means C2 is negative 1 over radical 3. And I can finally write the answer. So the answer, the final solution... Okay, I'm going to actually again make myself some room so we can fit all this nicely into one page so this right here tells me c2 is negative 1 over radical 3 and now we can go back to our solution here and plug the c1 and c2 and then we're done so therefore y is equal e to the 2t times what was the C1? C1 disappeared. So that goes away. So you're just going to end up with the C2, which is negative 1 radical 3 sine radical 3t. We can even write it as negative e to the 2t over radical 3 
times sine radical 3 t. There you have it. That's our solution to this IVP. Okay, I hope you guys were able to find the same answer. So notice I try to provide you with as many examples as possible. Not again, the disadvantages makes some of these videos longer, but I want to make sure that I provide you with as many examples as possible so you can see the variety of these. All right, let's do another example, and then we're going to discuss how this relates back to spring mass systems and what do these three different cases of how the solutions, the types of solutions or types of roots, how do they relate to the physical sense and the physical application of spring mass systems. Here is the interesting thing that I want to mention before I do that. This process for solving using characteristic equations is not limited to second order. It can actually work for higher order differential equations. So it can work for third order, fourth order, fifth order. What's going to be the difference? The difference is instead of getting a quadratic, you're going to get a polynomial of a higher order. So for example, if you have a Q, if you have a third, third order differential equation, you're going to get a cubic polynomial. So the challenge becomes algebraic. It becomes, you have to remember the skills you learned in pre-calculus for finding zeros of polynomials, basically. That's what it comes down to. If it's quadratic, it's not bad because you can just use a quadratic formula. But if it's power 3, power 4, power 5, then we don't have a nice formula to work with. So you have to use the techniques you learned in pre-calculus. If it's not easy to factor it, then you have to remember how to use the rational zero theorem, the P and Q, synthetic division, long division, some of those techniques you learned in pre-calculus. I know some of you are thinking, wow, I have to remember that stuff. Well, that's the trick for higher order ones. So let's do an example for higher order. And we're not going to spend too much time on the higher order ones, but it's one of those things that it's nice for you to at least see it, see a couple examples. So at least you got the gist of how it works. Uh, let's see here. I can find a nice example for you. I could pick out one from textbook here. Let's see. All right, so let's use this example. So what if we have y triple prime plus y double prime minus 5y prime plus 3y equals to zero. So again, the question is solve. So you find the general solution. So start out the same way. Characteristic equation. The y, y, the uh, third derivative becomes r cubed, then plus r squared minus 5r plus 3 equals zero. Okay. Now, I need to find what makes this zero. Uh, I could say, well, can I factor it? Remember you learned technique, if you have more than three terms, you can try to factor by grouping. Even if you try that, it's not going to work here. So that's out. So this is where you use the rational zero theorem. So this is an opportunity to review some of that. Rational zero theorem, if you don't remember that, tells you that if you've got some kind of whole number or a fraction of two integers that will make this zero, the top part of the fraction should divide into this number and the bottom part should divide into the number in front of the leading term. So one technique is to try to enumerate all the possible fractions you could get by dividing factors of the last number by factors of the first number. But, you're not, but they don't automatically become zeros. You have to try them out. And one way to try them out is to use synthetic division or to plug them in or to use long division. Right? So if you get a remainder of zero, you know it works. So let P be the numerator. So P must divide into 3. That symbol means a divisor of. So what are the possible numbers that divide into 3? Well, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. Q must be a divisor of 1. So what are the possibilities for Q? That's plus or minus 1. So the fractions 
that I could come up with are plus or minus 1 over 1, which is just 1, and then plus or minus 3 over 1, which would be just plus or minus 3. So the rational zero theorem tells you that if you have a fraction or a whole number that's a zero of this polynomial, it must be in this list. So that's a good, at least a good starting point. So how do you know which one? You're not going to know. You have to do trial and error. So you can do synthetic division if you're familiar with that or, or long division. Or you can just plug it into this polynomial and see, does it make it zero? So I can already see that, uh, or I'm going to try synthetic division. So here's how synthetic division works. You take the coefficients of your polynomial, which will be 1, 1, negative 5, and 3. And you take one of the numbers from the list here that you want to try. So, I don't know, randomly I'm going to pick a number, like negative 3. And then here is the algorithm you repeat. This is the set of steps you're going to do. You bring this first number down. Then you times it by this number. And you put the answer here. Then again, you add vertically. So this becomes negative 2. And you keep repeating those steps. So negative 2 times that gives you 6. Add vertically, you get 1. 1 times that gives me negative 3. Add vertically, you get 0. This is very good news because that's the remainder. In fact, the remainder theorem also tells you that the number that you get here is actually the number you would get if you took this number here and plugged it into this polynomial, which is kind of cool. It always works. So what we just, by finding zero here, we basically just proved that if you take the negative three and plug it back into that polynomial, you're going to get zero, which means that's one of the numbers that will make it zero. So that's one of the R's that make it zero. But of course, that's not the only number. Because it's, it's a cubic, we expect to find three answers that make it zero, three numbers or three roots. So how are we going to get the other roots? Here's the cool thing. This part here actually gives you the quotient. In fact, technically it's the coefficients of the quotient, but we can reverse engineer it into a quotient. So that gives you r squared minus 2r plus 1. And this part here tells you that r plus 3 is one of the factors. So we already know, by doing the synthetic division, this gave us the ability to factor the polynomial like this. Isn't that cool? Again, if you've seen this in pre-calculus and you remember it, all of this should be reviewed. But again, I'm treating it as if it's completely novel to you or you don't remember it at all. So. That's the key there. So all I have to do now is just try to find the solution to this one, because I already know the solution to this one is negative 3, and I've got all the zeros. Good news, this already factors, so r minus 1, r minus 1. And now I've got everything I need. So look what, what I found. I found r is negative 3, or r is 1, and this is a repeated root. This is a repeated root. Isn't that cool? So, can you guess how we write the solution? This, you're not going to find it in that patterns, the patterns we had for the quadratic, because this is a cubic. But you can learn from how we built those different patterns to try to construct a pattern for this one. So, this is going to have a c1 e to the negative 3t. This is going to have a c2 e to the t, or 1t. The fact that it's repeated, it's going to have another factor here, or another term, that's going to be t times e to the t. And there you have it. Notice it doesn't have two parameters. It's got c uh, three parameters, c1, c2, c3. That's not surprising, because it's a uh, third order. So you've got that solution. Okay, again, it's your turn. So what if you have the fourth order derivative of y 
you, in Leibniz notation, minus 16y equals 0. So take a moment and see if you can solve that one. Now this one is going to be easier. You're not going to have to use synthetic division or any of that jazz. But try it first and then come back. All right, I hope you were able to complete this one. So first characteristic equation is r to the fourth minus 16 equals 0. Now you see the good news? The good news is I can actually factor this. So I don't have to use any drastic measures. So r to the 4 minus 16 equals 0 can be factored into r squared minus 4 and r squared plus 4. This can be further factored into r minus 2 and r plus 2. So I have r squared plus 4 equals 0. Okay, here I am again trying to squeeze everything in one little place. So let's try the actual zeros here. So what are the numbers that make it zero? Well, r equals 2, r equals negative 2. Those are single solutions. And then this one, by the way, is going to give you two conjugate imaginaries. Because you get r squared equals negative 4, which means r is equal to plus or minus 2i. Okay, because if you square root and you remove the absolute value, you get plus or minus. Square root of negative 4 is 2i, so you get plus or minus 2i. So, what does this mean? How do I handle this? Well, that actually it goes back to the blueprint for imaginary, but the alpha is 0. So this means alpha is 0 and beta is 2. So when you go to write the formula with e to the alpha t, what's going to happen to the e to the alpha t? Well, if alpha is 0, e to the alpha t is going to be 1. So the e part disappears. Right? So when you actually write the pattern, it's going to be y equals c1 e to the 2t plus c2 e to the negative 2t plus c3 cosine 2t plus c4 sine 2t. Notice I don't have an exponential. So that's the solution. Again, we don't want to forget. We've got four parameters. Not surprising because this is a fourth order. All these four parameters are arbitrary. Real numbers. Okay, isn't that cool? So now you see that that technique works not just for second order, works for higher order as well. All right, let's actually now bring it back to the spring mass system. So remember when we worked with the spring mass system, we said this is the more general differential equation. This means you have an external force. This has to do with the spring. This has to do with the fact that we have the mass, and this has to do with the fact that we have damping. So some kind of way, some kind of friction, like a dash pot, that slows down the motion. So if it's n-damped, so if it's just mx double dot plus b, or let's actually make it kx, kx equals 0. So the first thing we can discover together, remember when we did this, we said just take it for granted that the answer is c1 cosine omega naught t plus c2 sine omega naught t. And we said don't worry about where that came from, you'll find out later. So this is now where we get to see where that came from. This was again the n-damped and forced motion, which we also refer to as simple harmonic motion. So let's now we have the tools to actually prove this, prove how where that formula came from. Well, let's take a look at this. First of all, we 
showed you that mx double dot kx equals zero. If we divide by m, we can write it as x double dot plus k over m x equals zero. And we said that this part right here is omega naught squared because omega naught is the square root of k over m. That's how omega naught is defined. So this can be written as x double dot plus omega naught squared x equals zero. All right, are you guys with me so far? Let's switch to the characteristic equation. So the characteristic equation of this is going to be r squared plus omega naught squared equals zero. It's the same way we did this with the y. The only difference is instead of the variable y, we're using variable x. And instead of using prime notation, we're using dot notation. That's really the only adjustments you have to make when you switch to the engineering system. Okay, so let's solve this. So find the zeros of this. Well, this is kind of like the one we just did where we had r squared plus 4 equals 0. Omega naught squared is going to be some kind of positive number. So you're going to get two conjugate imaginaries and the alpha is going to be zero. So you would get r squared equals negative omega naught squared. If you square root r squared, you square root this, this will give you absolute value of r equals omega naught times i which means r is plus or minus omega naught i. So according to our blueprint, alpha is zero and beta is omega naught. So if you write the formula just with the adjustment that I don't, I mean, not using y, I'm using x, this formula here that we wrote earlier, like y of t equals e to the alpha t, c1 cosine beta t plus c2 sine beta t. Rewrite that with these adjustments by using this alpha, this beta, and use x in lieu of y. It becomes e to the 0 t c1 cosine omega naught t plus c2 sine omega naught t. What happens to e to the 0? e to the 0 will just be 1. So we don't even have to keep writing that. So it just reduces to this. Et voila. That's exactly the equation that we came up with when we studied this in the sim simple harmonic motion. And of course, we saw how we can convert that to the alternate form. But all I wanted to show you here is how, where that came from, because then I know it's probably bothering you, and it was bothering me that I haven't shown you that yet. Okay, even better. So this was the endamped enforced case. Okay, so what if you have damping, but you don't have force? So let's generalize it a little bit more. So what if we have mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx equals zero. So we have now some damping in there. So this is damped and forced case. Well, what does that do mathematically? Well, the quadratic now has a middle term. So it has an R term, which means when you go to do the quadratic formula, your alpha is not going to be zero if you're going to get it, even if uh, that's if you get imaginaries. And not only that, you could get the three cases. This is where you get the three cases. All right, so let's try. What's the characteristic equation? Well, it'll be mr squared plus br plus k equals zero. So the delta is going to be b squared minus four times m times k. And r 
is going to be negative b plus or minus square root of delta over 2a, which, by the way, the a is m. So this would be 2m. So you see the adjustment here? The adjustment is my a is m. My b is the b from the damping. And my c is the k. So that's the adjustment. But you're still going to have the three possibilities. So you have the delta positive, delta is 0, and delta is negative. Well, if delta is positive, we already said we're going to get two, pos uh, two uh, distinct real numbers. So this is where you get y equals e to the r1t, c1 e to the r1t plus c2 e to the r2t again. We're not using y, we're using x. So this is where you get x of t equals c1 e to the r1t plus c2 e to the r2t. Now, what's the physical significance of this case? Well, let's analyze it. What's the delta? Delta is this. Delta is a fight between two things. It's a power struggle between two things. What are these two things? On one hand, it's the b squared, and on the other hand, it's the 4mk. It's a comparison between these two. Remember what these mean when it comes to the physical characteristic of the system. b represents how much damping you're applying. And 4mk, m and k, have to do more of the inertia of the system. They have to do with k is the stiffness of the system and mass is telling you how much iner inertia is going on with the mass to help to keep it moving. So when you compare these two, you're basically comparing or you're gauging the amount of damping in the system and whether the spring can overcome that and by how much can it overcome that. So it comes down simply to this kind of like struggle between these two things. And whichever one wins is going to decide certain type of behavior. So let's, th let's process it for a minute. If delta is positive, that means we're saying that this is greater. The b squared is bigger than 4mk. That's actually what we call overdamped system. Why? Because you've got way too much damping that it's overcoming the ability of the spring to keep the motion going. So this is an overdamped system. Okay, and we're going to look at some cool pictures of some of these. So an overdamped system, can you imagine the motion of this? An overdamped system is not going to be able to oscillate much. There's too much damping that's immediately going to grind it to a halt. It's not going to let it do any cycling, really. It will be lucky to even do one oscillation. That's when overdamped. And obviously, there's a little degree to it. So, so if, if B squared is barely bigger than 4MK, it's not as strong of damping as b squared being a lot bigger than 4mk. So even in the overdamped, there are many different degrees of being overdamped. But in general, overdamped is hardly going to let the actual uh, the mass oscillate. Right? So typically, it's not going to complete even a single cycle. How about if delta equals 0? Now remember, that's when you get the repeated root case. So if delta equals 0 then r is going to be negative b over 2a, which in this case will be 2m. And you're going to get x of t equals c1 e to the rt plus c2 t e to the rt. So that's the blueprint we followed earlier. The only adjustment is we're using x instead of y. So if b is 0, that means that these two are equal. Okay, so if they're equal, that's basically telling you that the spring 
trying to keep the motion going and the mass, because remember, the spring and the mass together are trying to keep the motion going. The mass tries to pull things, if you're doing this vertically, the, the mass is pulling things uh, down, and the spring is trying to restore it back up, and that's, and both of those, the tussle between those two is what keeps this going. But if you've got as much damping as the product of M and K by four, then this is saying that it's damped enough to counteract most of the motion, but it's not too much damping that's gonna grind it to a halt very quickly. So this is still damped, but it's not over damped. So it's still gonna slow down the oscillations and eventually is gonna, they're gonna die, uh, the oscillations are gonna die down, but it's not gonna happen instantly. So this is called a critically damped system. And the last case is when you get the imaginary. So this is where you get R equals alpha plus or minus beta I. So your X of T is gonna be E to the alpha T times C1 cosine beta T plus C2 sine beta T. Now, this is when you don't have enough damping. So B squared is smaller than 4MK. So there is damping, there could be damping, but it's not strong enough. So guess what's gonna happen? Well, this is gonna, the, the system is gonna be able to oscillate a lot more freely for a longer time before it eventually dies up. Right, so, so there's a little bit less uh, damping, which means it's got more freedom to keep oscillating. But if there is still damping, it's not simple harmonic motion. So this is called under damped. But here's a good question for you. Where does the undamped case fall? Well, we listed all the cases, but we didn't mention undamped. Where does the undamped case fall? Well, undamped is basically a subcase of this. Special subcase is when R is equal to plus or minus beta I, right? And that beta will be what we just showed to be the omega naught. In that scenario, the e to the alpha part will disappear. So you'll get simple harmonic motion. Which when we wrote it will be cosine omega naught t plus c2 sine omega naught t, where omega naught is the square root of the ratio of k to m. So this is the undamped case. So the undamped case is a speci special subcase of the underdamped case, right? Because underdamped, this case here means b squared is less than 4mk. Well, that could happen if you do have a b, but it happens to be small, smaller, or if you don't even have a b. So if you don't have a b, b is zero, then you go to this. The alpha disappears basically, right? If b is zero. So special subcase here is b is zero. No damping at all. It's not just some damping that's weak. You don't even have any damping. So that's the end of it. So this is a special case of this much more uh, generic case for the underdamped. So there you have it. We covered all the possibilities and how they relate to this. Now you're probably wondering what kind of graphs do you get for the damped and underdamped and undamped and all these. So what I'm going to do is actually, uh, let's see, let's show you at least one a glimpse of this through an example. So maybe we'll pick one of the cases at least and show you 
Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. Let's let's look at one case. So for example, y double prime plus two y prime plus four y equals zero. Now I'm not going to go through uh, all the calculations, but this is if you do the r, you're going to get negative one plus or minus square root of three i. So this is according to our previous chart. This falls under the under damped. It's not undamped. It's under damped because there is an alpha. This is the alpha. This is the beta. So this will be y of t equals e to the negative t times c1 cosine square root of 3t plus c2 sine square root of 3t. Now to help us visualize this, and we've seen this before, to put it in the face portrait, I need to convert it to a system of two first order differential equations. Now we've done this before, by the way, when I had the x's and I let the y equal x dot to do the conversion. This time, my actually letter that I'm using is y, so when I convert it, I'm gonna use x as the second letter. So I'm gonna let x equal to y prime. So if I let x equal y prime, then the first equation, or the second equation becomes y prime equals x, and then the first equation so we have y double prime plus 2y prime plus 4y equals 0. This is the one that needs a little bit more surgery. I can immediately replace the y prime with x. And what's y double prime? Well, y double prime becomes the derivative of this. So y double prime becomes x prime. So x prime becomes negative 2x minus 4y. So that's going to go into my system. Negative 2x minus 4y. All right, now we can actually feed this into our Java applet and see what the phase plane is going to look like. And I'm actually more interested in in the displacement. So I'm going to look at, remember, when you do this, you can have three graphs. You can do displacement versus time. You can do velocity versus time. And you can do velocity versus displacement. Now, be careful. This is here where you don't want to get lost because the letters are kind of backwards. In our case, because we started out with the equation having a y in it, y represents our displacement. So this would be the y. And x is y prime, so x is our velocity. So this would be y prime with respect to time. This would be y with respect to time. I'm actually going to zero in on this one. Because I want, I want you to see, not just the face portrait, but I want you to see what the displacement does when we have under damped. Okay. So remember, this is under damped. So under damped means you don't have enough damping. It's damped, but not significant enough to really slow it down. All right, so there we are now. I'm going to go ahead and switch view and put it on the... Java applet here. I'm going to hide. Let me close this thing here. And we're going to go in here. And for the x, I'm going to put negative 2 times x and negative 4 times y. And for the y prime, I'm going to put x. And Let's do graph it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and maybe adjust my scale. So maybe like, I don't know, negative five to five. It's always important to try things until you get a good, nice view. 
and that takes some experimenting. Here we go. This is going to work out nicely. So now, obviously, this gives you the entire. This is the entire phase plane. So all of these are solutions. And that's what, by the way, is described by the formula we came up with. But what I'm interested in is what do these look like? So let's pick a few of them. So let's draw a few of them. So I'm going to click in few of them. Do you guys see something cool? Do you remember when we graphed the simple harmonic, which was undamped? Do you remember what the graphs looked like? They were perfect circles. They were cycles, right? They were closed circles. This is already showing you that these are loops that are not closed. They're not closed loops. They're uh, curves that are not closed loops, which means there is no repeated pattern. So the oscillations do not repeat themselves. Now again, remember what this graph represents. This graph represents velocity, which is y on top here, versus the displacement, which again technically would be the the y down here and velocity is the x up here because again we switch our letters in our um, in our formulas so let's actually take a look at the the uh, time series graphs i'd like to see so let's pick one of these maybe this one there is a cool picture to look at this beautiful picture this shows you what the x and the y are doing with respect to time. Now remember, x, y represents the displacement, x represents the velocity. So let's focus on the y. Look at the y. It does a little bit of oscillating and then eventually dies off. Right? The uh, x is the y prime, the the x is the y prime, so the x is the velocity. All right, so the x is the velocity, so that's why when the velocity here is high, the y is small. Right. One way, by the way, to relate these is to use calculus, because remember, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, so the slope of the this red curve here, the slope here is positive and large, because it's steep this way, so that corresponds to the blue line being up here. Then here, when you get a peak in the line and the graph and the red line or the red curve, that's when you get a horizontal tangent line. So the slope should be zero. That's where the blue line crosses the, the x-axis or the, the horizontal axis. And so on. On this part right here, the slope of the tangent line is negative. That's why the blue curve is underneath. But as you can see, there's some oscillating happening. Not a lot, but there's some oscillating happening. Okay. So that's the underdamped case. Now, if we didn't have any damping at all, if we didn't have any damping at all, then um, the graph will actually go on forever. So how would that happen here? So let me see if I can make an adjustment. If you didn't have any damping at all, the term that that was 2y prime will disappear, which means the 2x term will disappear, which means this part here wouldn't even show up. So let's see. Let me close this out. This shows you. There you have it. We go back to simple harmonic motion. There you get to simple harmonic motion. Now, let's look at the time series for this. Okay, it needs adjustment of the scale. It's not a very good scale there, but they did automatically. But basically these are sinusoids, they're just really um, compressed together. But you get regular pattern of a sinusoid. It never dies out. Right, one sinusoid for the velocity, one sinusoid for the displacement. Okay, how about uh, overdamped? So, what would happen if we have overdamped? So, 
Remember, overdamped is if you get two real solutions. So I'm going to pick another example. So let me go back here. Get back to the notes here. And let's show you an example of overdamped. And to make it less confusing here, I'm going to actually use x as uh, my variable. So let's do an example that's overdamped. We can cheat and pick one from some of the ones we did earlier. Let's go back to one of the examples we did earlier that was overdamped. This was imaginary stuff. Here we go. This was a good example. Remember, we got two different real numbers. So that's the overdamped case. That's when the delta is positive. So let's use this equation. Okay, so I'm going to keep that in mind. And I'm going to go back, so it's minus 3y prime plus 2y. So let me remember that. Minus 3y prime plus 2y. Minus 3y prime plus 2y. I'm going to first, because again, I don't want you to get confused about the x and the y, let's change it to a spring mass system notation. So let's make this x double dot minus 3x dot plus 2x equals 0. Now, now let's do our change of variable. So let's y equal x dot. So this second equation, this equation becomes y dot minus 3y plus 2x equals 0. Okay, I hope everybody's following that. Since y is x dot, x double dot is y dot, which means y dot is equal to two, uh, negative 2x plus 3y. And of course, the first equation comes from that. So here's my system. My system is the derivative of x is y, and the derivative of y is negative 2x plus 3y. Now, I already know this is supposed to be overdamped. So there's too much damping. Okay, so let's go back and graph this one. See how the graphs will compare. So this time the x dot is just y. And the y dot is negative 2 times x plus 3 times y. Again, let's graph it. And let's see what the graphs look like. By the way, when we did the solution of this, remember the solution had like 1 and 2. So the solution, if you solve this, the solution would look like this. x of t equals c1 e to the 2t plus c2 e to the t. Now, that's the general solution. Let's think about that pattern for a second. The fact that both of these are positive, you're going to get values of x as t gets bigger that will... Uh, increase exponentially and they're both positive unless the C's are, are not if you but as long as you pick uh, things typically generally you're gonna find in general sense that this gets bigger and this gets bigger as T goes to infinity so that means the graph of the solution should be straying away from the origin should be running away from zero it's not gonna go toward zero so that's why, as you can see from all the arrows from our phase plane, if I click anywhere, the graphs are running away from zero. It's going in that direction. In fact, we can make this clear by telling it to only graph things forward in time. So don't graph things backwards and forward. I just want it forward in time. So I'm going to go ahead and actually clear. Let's clear. And then we want it to be forward in time. Good. Now let's graph it. 
So when it traces out the solution, it's tracing it out as time increases. So it's showing you how it, the graph has drawn as t gets bigger. So if I click here, that's shooting out like that. This right here is shooting out this way and it's curving around. This one here is going around, coming down this way and so on. So all these solutions are kind of drifting away from the origin, right? In fact, there's some kind of line there. So you can kind of think that there's some, um, there's some unstable equilibrium there. But even better is when you look at the uh, time series. So let's pick one of these graphs, maybe this one here. And let's look at the what the X and the Y are doing for that part. So the X and the Y, so X is Y prime, negative 2X. Oh, I made a mistake, didn't I? Shoot. It doesn't like this notation. So I need to put a times there. Maybe not. Maybe it still did okay with it. All right, let's pick one of these graphs. And let's select it. And let's look at the solutions. So look what the solutions are doing. That's kind of interesting. The solutions are drifting away exponentially. Now, that's not surprising because, again, the formula is C1 e to the 2t plus C2 e to the uh, t, right? So there's some drift all the way up there. Now, the um, which one is which? The x is the displacement, and let's see. So the no, the x is the displacement, and the y is the um, the x is the displacement, and the y is the velocity. So the blue is the displacement, and as you can see, there's some more damping to that, and the velocity is tracking the tangent line to that. So it's going all the way up there. This is probably not the best example for the overdamped case. I mean, it just shows you the variety, but typically what you get for an overdamped or underdamped. So let me kind of go back to the uh, note here. It's hard to show you all the possibilities, but the typical pattern is the following. So if it's, so here are some pictures to kind of highlight the different cases. So, for example, if you have um, an underdamped, you're going to get something like this. Maybe something like that, depending on the initial condition. Right, so this is underdamped. Those are the kind of graphs you can kind of expect. This is for displacement versus time. So we're talking the time series graph. Now, what does the phase portrait look like? Well, the phase portrait, depending on whether the exponentials, uh, which way they go, the phase portrait will typically give you uh, stuff like we saw earlier, like stuff that kind of drifts cycles toward the origin like that now what makes it go toward the origin is depends on the alpha if the alpha is negative that exponential in front c1 cosine blah 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 this here as t gets bigger it will go to zero so that's what makes it cycle toward the, the origin but if alpha is positive it's going to drift get bigger so it drifts away from the origin so you get something that cycles outward instead okay so that's what the face portrait might look like now if it's uh, the overdamped case so let me show you some pictures of the overdamped and the um, critically damped so overdamped Something like this. Sometimes you may not even see 
a half oscillation it will might do something like this and just kind of dies off right so that's over damped again what does the phase portrait look like well it might have exponentials that do something like this like the picture we just looked at the drift away what makes them drift away versus come back home go toward the origin depends on whether the r is positive or negative so if i had r equals 2 and r equals 1 those are positive numbers they make the exponential go to infinity so these will be like that right but if one if r was negative two and the other r is negative one then both of those are going to suck the actual uh, graph toward the origin long term if one of them is positive one of them is negative then the one that's going to win is the one that has the bigger coefficient in front of it so it will depend what which c is bigger the c c in front of the the r that's positive or c in front of the r that's negative so Again, this is not the only picture you would get, but that's one way to think of those pictures. For the repeated route, one possible way to uh, to get the graph is the, again, they show you some pictures here in your book as well, but, but one possible way for the repeated route is you could get some oscillation, not as much as the ender damped, but you could get maybe some a little bit more oscillating than this. So this would be like the critically damped. This is not the only kind of picture you could get there. You could get, so you could get something that oscillates a little bit more. So you could do something like this and then dies off, right? So, so again, it all depends on your initial condition and your parameters and, and how much the B squared compares to the 4MK. So there isn't a unique picture you're going to get, but you can kind of get a sense of what you would expect. So under damp typically means you're going to have a bit more leeway for oscillating. Critically damped is kind of on the verge between the two. Maybe some oscillating, but not too much. And uh, over damped, you're, not, you're hardly going to oscillate. Right? So these are the kind of things. But again, within over damped, there are many different pictures you could get depending on how much over damped you are, right? And within under damped, there are many different levels. You could be even undamped, then it will be uh, just a simple harmonic motion. All right, I tried to cover a lot of information, so you're probably overwhelmed. Uh, I hope this helps. I try to be thorough as much as I can, so I hope this, uh, this is useful to you. And thank you for, for watching. All right.